around the walls we have state water board, we have North Coast Regional Water Board, we have planning and building, we have tax collectors, we have the Agricultural Department, we have California Department of Fish and Wildlife, we have the California Department of Food and Agriculture, we have CAL FIRE, we have Environmental Health, we have the new Compliance Officer, and we have Sheriff Randy Johnson. So, with that to do, my name is Tina, I thank you all for coming, and I am now going to turn it over to Arif. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I thank you all for spending this time to come over, and we hope it will be as beneficial to everybody here, as you expect. Like she just mentioned, we've got all the state agencies around here that you need to get into contact with. If you have any questions, they're all here. They'll give presentations and you'll be able to ask them everything. I hope everybody got the application packet from outside. And uh, later on, the Ag Department will come in in the presentation. We'll help you, we'll make you understand how to fill it out. And before you leave, if you have time, the Ag Department is taking appointments. Once the audience becomes live, we want you, you, we want you to be able to hand in the application. We have applications made up prior, so things can flow smoothly. Now, in the application packet, in the application packet if you look at it, uh, in the first page, or the second page, you've got all this list, the application checklist, cultivation application, cultivation application plan, property owner, affidavit sample, fingerprinting, site plan and checklist, property profile sample, cultural resources portion, medical cannabis cultivation, program fees schedule, so your fees are there too. No surprises for anybody. You've <laughs> got uh, cannabis tax information, the tax collector is over here, if you have any questions. Medicine County Medical Cannabis Ordinance 10.17, which I hope you all are you know, familiar with. They have been on our county and it's a website for a long time. And 20.242, the Building and Planning Ordinance, which you should know pretty well too by now. And then if you're a primary caregiver or a patient, there's information for you there. And you have other resources in, in the end that will, that will help you out in case of anything. I would appeal to you to please hold back your questions till all the presentations are over. Write them down so that once they all end up talking about or giving the presentation, you, can, you have time. You'll have half an hour to ask questions. I don't want people to be interrupted in the middle because we have limited time. It's a two and a half and we've got a lot of information that we want to give out to everybody. We want to educate the cultivators want to educate the public so we can move forward. Without further ado, I will call in Carl Fire, Mr. Ryan Smith, he'll be our first presenter. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. In your packets, um, towards the front, you should have an or a packet that looks like this. is California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, CAL FIRE, the permit place. You can find that for me. Give me a second. Oh, it's in the back. Okay, thank you. So towards the back of the packet, very much. Once everybody gets here, I'm not going to necessarily go like forward to back following through this packet. However, every bit of information I'm going to cover is found in here. So if anything comes up question-wise, you should be able to reference this packet. If later after this meeting something comes up, again, if, if you have a question for me that pops up, please write it down and cover it in the uh, questions and answers uh, towards the end of the presentation. So um, essentially, to cover the process where CAL FIRE will get involved in the process for you would only be if you're applying for a building permit through planning and building. If that occurs, if you're applying for some sort of building permit, then CAL FIRE, if you are in state responsibility area, will then enact the fire safe regulations, which is uh, under government, or excuse me, public resources code 4290. And um, so following along with the packet, you'll find all the resources for that. 
And uh, real quick, on the uh, back of the first page of that packet, at the top, it will say California Department of Forestry, and you have a phone number and a mailing address. That is for our headquarters for Mendocino Unit. That's where all this application stuff would get mailed to on all correspondence uh, via phone as well. Um, so if you are applying for a permit, uh, Planning and Building Department is going to tell you you need a CAL FIRE application. That application can be found on the County Planning and Building website under the Forms and Handouts tab. It's about halfway down on the page, we'll say CAL FIRE application. You'll fill out that application, turn it into the address listed uh, right there in the packet, and then we're going to review that and then come up with a condition to approval based on your project, um, looking at the fire safe regulations. There is an example in your packet that says conditions of approval that's just a blank copy. That's exactly what I would mail back to you, and I'm just going to check boxes as appropriate pertaining to your project. The things that we're going to be looking at for your uh, project are address marking, that it's three inch reflectorized, visible from both directions of travel on the roadway so emergency equipment can find your, your structure. Um, road and driveway standards and all the criteria is out, uh, outlined in that packet. Uh, property setbacks, which if you're over an acre is a 30 foot setback. So if you're less than an acre, then it's with the county standard, which I believe is six feet. Um, one of the other things would be emergency water storage. <coughs> this question is probably going to get asked a lot and it's really uh, parcel independent and your project dependent. So that's on a case by case basis whether you even need emergency water storage. Some of the criteria for that is going to be whether you're within five miles of a year round fire station or within a half a mile of a working fire hydrant. If you are in compliance with either, either of those, you're not going to need emergency water storage. Um, do you cover also with emergency water storage so you understand when that is enacted, it is for emergency, emergency use only, so it cannot also be used in the cultivation process for, for any other use. Um, and then the other thing would be defensible space standards, which we also uh, go out and you probably encountered us on a yearly basis going out and doing defensible space inspections anyway, and we do that to just help you make your property more fire safe and defensible against wildland fire. So you'll see us doing that as well outside of this process. Um, so once you get back that conditions of approval um, and we've reviewed your application, the next part in the process will be that you complete the building and you then request a final inspection. Once all conditions have been met, you'll call the number, um, again listed there on the back side of the first page, and then schedule for a final inspection. We'll come out, look at your project. If every, all the requirements have been met, then uh, we'll issue you a letter of final clearance. That gets submitted to planning a building, and they issue your final permit. End of story. If there is some kind of a, a thing that pops up that does not pass the inspection, we're always going to give you a chance to fix it. So usually, whether it's in person or we give you a phone call, we're going to you know, tell you what we had an issue with and how to fix it. If it's something really simple like an address marking or weed eating around the structure, usually I'll say, if you can get that done in the next couple days, email me a photo or text me a photo and I'll get you the final just to speed up the process. If it's a little more major than that, then we'll just have to ask you to reschedule a final once you've completed the work. And then we can hopefully correct the problem. In the case that you absolutely cannot meet the requirements, whether it's a, usually a roadway or driveway standard, that can't be met. Sometimes you may be grandfathered in if that roadway existed um, and was permitted previously. Um, these ordinances went into effect in 91, so generally if it was created prior to that, you may already be exempt from that roadway standard. Um, and again, that's a case-by-case -case basis and we'll review that during your application. Um, yeah, and if for some reason you can't come into compliance, Unfortunately, at that point, we'll put incomplete, and I'll mail you a letter that'll say incomplete on, on the uh, final clearance. And then you, at that point, can appeal with the planning and building department, and uh, you'll take that letter, send it to them with your appeal notice. And at that point, they have the ability to still grant you a permit or not. That's up to them at that point. Um, that's pretty much the whole process. Within this packet, like I said, there's a bunch of information for defensible space 
and all the uh, PRC 4290 regulations, fire safe regulations, um, and they're pretty well spelled out. But again, if you have any additional questions, um, either you can ask when we do the 30 minute Q&A at the end, or I'll be seated over here, come find me at the end, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, again, my name is Ryan Smith, and 459-7414, uh, contact number, um, and just ask for fire prevention. And Can you say that number one more time? Yeah, it's 459-7414. And again, that's on the back side of the first page of that packet. Yep. All right. Um, that's pretty much the whole process that would involve Cal Fire. Uh, actually, one other thing I would mention um, is if timber, as I understand in the ordinance, cannot be removed for cultivation purposes. However, if you have to remove timber for construction of a building, that's a different matter, in which case it doesn't involve my office fire prevention, it involves resource management for uh, Cal Fire. So if you want to make a note of that, if that's something you think is going to come up for you, that um, you have to have a review by resource management. Same phone number, you just call and say, I need resource management to review um, cutting of timber for a construction project. All right, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ryan. We have the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Angela. I just feel a little soft with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I work out of the Fort Bragg office. We also have um, Corinne Gray in the back who works from um, the Napa office. So our department has split um, the county of Mendocino for, for cannabis regulation. So people that are south of Highway 20 are going to be working with the Napa office. People north of Highway 20 within Mendocino County are going to be working with the Fort Bragg office. So I'll have contact information in the last uh, slide. So there is a PowerPoint coming up. Um, so uh, one thing I want to emphasize for everybody, if you get anything out of this, is that if you're going to be doing any work in or near a stream, or diverting water from a stream, or from a well that's near a stream, anything that's hydrologically connected to a stream, you're going to need a, a stream that alteration agreement from us. So that's important. Even if you have a water right, even if you have permits from someone else, you're still going to need a, a stream alteration agreement. Sometimes people call it a 1600 permit, just so you know. And actually, for the state licensing um, process, you're going to have to either have an agreement from us, or you're going to have to have a letter that says, um, a letter from us that says that you don't need one. So I would encourage people to, to go ahead and uh, work with us during the county's permitting process so you can get all that taken care of. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife's authority, some of the critical species that um, require protection that we're concerned about, uh, rural land use impacts that are associated with development, um, CDFW's jurisdiction, what it looks like on the ground, water diversion, um, which would be surface water, springs and wells, water storage, which would be ponds and tanks, stream crossings, which would be um, culverts, armored field crossings, bridges, things like that. And then um, I'll show some pictures of some sites that are violations because they are not very well installed, and then some that uh, look pretty decent. So um, the, department's, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has, authority, has jurisdiction over the conservation, protection, and management of fish, wildlife, uh, native plants, and habitat necessary to maintain them.
Um, so our department is um, a responsible agency under the California Endangered Species Act and um, other fish and game code sections that conserve uh, the state's fish, wildlife, fish and wildlife public trust resources. So that, doesn't only, that does not only apply to listed species, it also applies to all native species. Uh, most likely the permit that you would need from us is a lake or stream bed alteration agreement, like I was saying, and that's um, under Fish and Game Code section 1600, 1602. And uh, like I was saying earlier, that would cover um, stream crossings and water diversions and um, other work near streams. I'm oh, sorry for that. So coho, you probably know coho, um, salmon are, depending on where you are, are threatened or endangered, um, listed under the state, and they're a federally endangered species. We also have steelhead trout in this area that are federally um, endangered species, so we're concerned about those. So um, in-stream flow is basically the amount of water that you're allowing to stay in a stream when you, if you are someone who diverts from it. So here, some reasons why it's important to maintain in-stream flow is that um, stream ripples, uh, shallow areas, must have enough flow to produce the, uh, the food that fish need, which would be uh, small invertebrates. Um, Dewatered areas uh, reduce the amount of oxygen that's in the water for fish. And then um, obviously fish can't migrate. They can't move if, um, if there's no water. Um, erosion, which is sometimes a result of um, grading, um, uh, road construction, and other things that are not done with appropriate erosion control. Um, erosion is a problem because fine sediment is transported into the water when we have precipitation. Um, it it de gets deposited in streams and fills in pools and fills in other areas like pore spaces that, that fish need and fish eggs need to, to be able to get oxygen. And um, it can cement gravels that will reduce the success of young fish. And the other issue um, that we need to be concerned about are southern torrent salamanders that are a California species of special concern. They live in um, they live high in the watershed, basically in headwater areas, springs, seeps, other things that maybe people don't think of as streams. Um, sometimes people will dig out a spring in order to get the water from there, and that's, um, that would affect that species. Um, they're found in uh, shallow, cold, clear, well-shaded areas, um, seeps and springs, and sometimes in uh, riparian vegetation that's adjacent to streams. So all these issues, if, if not um, handled appropriately, can lead to degraded watershed health. So that, that's why our, our department is concerned about that. So, um, rural land development, including for cannabis cultivation, usually includes development of a water source, road building, stream crossings, and grading, and so permits are required for most of that. So I, I don't necessarily need to talk about all of the, the actual code sections, but just be aware that if you're working in a stream, um, you're not allowed to, to uh, you, need to, you need a permit for that. You're not allowed to deliver, deliver pollution, including sediment, into streams. That would also be things like um, uh, petroleum products from, from pumps. Um, you're required to allow sufficient water to pass downstream for fish and amphibians uh, beyond your point of, point of diversion. And then um, you also can't prohibit or prevent uh, fish, you can't prevent fish passage by um, installing badly installed culverts or dams or things like that. Um, so um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife jurisdiction as far as streams includes all streams of the bed, channel, and bank. So that would be, um, for people who are familiar with the, the timber classifications, class one, class two, and class three streams would all be um, jurisdictional. And that would also include lakes, ponds, and uh, wetlands or wet areas. Here's an example of a class three stream that maybe people would look at and not necessarily think that it's a stream, but because it can transport water and sediment during precipitation, during times of precipitation, it would be considered a class three, and that's jurisdictional. 
Okay, so if you're directly diverting from a stream a, or a spring, um, you probably need a, a permit from our department. If you have a well that's near a stream, depending on where it is and, and how it interacts with the, how the hydrology interacts with the stream, you probably need a permit. Um, pond, wetland, wet area, permit, you need a permit. And then if you're diverting from areas where um, fish or amphibians could be present, then you'll need to have a screened intake so that you're not sucking animals through your pond. <laughs> so our we would work with you to determine an appropriate bypass flow, like I was talking about maintaining in stream flow um, beyond the point of diversion. Usually that's on the order of 80 or 90 percent bypass. Um, based on the site specific location of the, the, um, the point of diversion, how much water you're probably going to be using, we would uh, likely assign a period of time that you could not you cannot divert water. We wouldn't necessarily prescribe how much storage you would have, but we would recommend an amount that would cover that time for you. And then, um, yeah, water storage. So the other, the last thing on there was that rate of diversion slow is good. Most likely we would have a low rate of diversion, but you'd be pumping for a longer period of time. So you might be pumping at 10 gallons per minute for the entire, you know, a long period of time instead of pumping 100 gallons per minute for a couple hours a day. Um, here's an example of a screened intake. You can see the hose, and it's not just a you know the end of a pipe in there. There's a screen right there. Um, it would be, be sized appropriately for what you expect to be there, so that you're not um, uh, the animals aren't getting stuck on the screen. This is not good. This is um, the, they've dug out the. They've dug out and are basically diverting 100% of that spring. So um, these are the, obviously we see these frequently, but uh, we would we would work with the landowner to to correct that situation and get an appropriate bypass. You can skip that. One. So for ponds, and I know um, the state water board water rights people are here today. Um, for storage of water, you might require water rights. So you have to talk to them, but. Um, as far as our department, we would be uh, working with you. The off-stream ponds are um, preferred, um, and you know they basically have to be installed appropriately. But on-stream ponds are sometimes permitted, but they they need a lot more uh, design and review. Uh, so ponds. Uh, and I don't, it has under 80 days. Pond should be sized to meet the, your water needs for the amount of time that you'll be uh, basically not diverting water. Um, they should be able to be drained to interrupt uh, the bullfrog life cycle. The bullfrogs are a non-native invasive species that basically eat everything that's smaller than them, so we don't like to encourage them to be there. Uh, if you didn't have, if you weren't able to drain it, then we would work with you on a, some kind of monitoring and control plan. And then ponds need to be structurally, to have structural integrity. So they would need to be engineered. Um, they would have to have a spillway or overflow design. Yeah, an engineered design. So here's a, um, a couple of examples of good spillways. Um, they're armored to dis dissipate energy, uh, the complicated flow that's coming out, and then sized to accommodate the 100 year flood flow. So, um, we've got we get questions. I was just at the last one. People asking, you know, like I have you know I have a property with an old stock pond, and how are you guys going to deal with that? So it's it's this it's good to be able to look at aerial imagery to see you know basically is there a history to the pond. So if you feel like you have a stock pond that's really old, then go back and Google Earth and be able to show that so that we can you can take that into consideration. So there's a bunch of pictures of things that are like, no, that looks terrible, um, for probably obvious reasons. Um, obviously not stable, it's like sticking out the edge of the cliff. Um, they've done something weird with the stream over here. Obviously that culvert is not installed appropriately. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a good spillway. Um, so the, I will say that these 
these are actual, you know, these are pictures that my colleagues in Humboldt have, have put together basically of things that they've been observing. So there are a lot of places where people have done things that are not, you know, not only are they not good as far as you're concerned, but they're not going to last for them either. It's not a good investment. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> No, uh, okay, so things like this. So there's no spillway, which basically increases the, the likelihood that it's going to fail. It's going to keep overflowing, it's going to saturate the fill, and then it's just going to fail. So that's bad. Um, this, there's another picture of this later. Um, no appropriate spillway design. It's not, you know, that's, it's, it's an erosion issue. That'll be delivering sediment. That's bad. Okay, so that's the same thing again. Um, so wetlands, I got a question at the last one about, um, I think this person actually, the pond, he, he said it had been there for like a hundred years. It, it's possible, and I haven't seen it yet, but it's possible that it became a wetland. So he was concerned about that. What we're talking about here is places where people find a low spot and dig a pond. So, you know, we're, that's a violation. You're not allowed to just dig out a wetland to, to make a pond. <laughs> And, you know, we would, again, we'd work with you to try to remedy these issues, um, but, okay, yeah, I mean, some of these, it's pretty obvious what's wrong, but I'm just letting you know what we've been seeing. <laughs> yeah, so there's just, there are a lot of problems, so don't be nice. Yes. That was kind of my favorite because it, it's really clear that there are problems and you can see the problems. Uh, don't do that either. Can we see the after on that one? <laughs> I don't know if they're going to be So obviously here's a, a well, you know, installed um, stream crossing, a, a good culvert. I think the next one has one. Okay, so culverts, culverts don't need to be designed by an engineer. They just need to, they need to be sized appropriately and we need to see um, basically design information. So they need to be sized to pass the 100 year flood flow and associated debris. So depending on where you are, you might have more of a debris load than, than, uh, than some, you know, a flat area, let's say, with very trees. Uh, um, they need to be set to grade, aligned with the with the stream channel, and extend beyond the fill slope. So a lot of people try to get away with one 20 foot length of culvert. That's probably not going to work for a 20 foot wide road. You're probably going to need to do a, you know one and a half sticks, 30 feet at least, in order to get out um, beyond the edges of the road, so that you're not having all that you know the fill from the road just going. Through. And then uh, rock armoring might be, it, it is, it's, it, most likely rock armoring is necessary around the culvert to uh, dissipate energy and reduce erosion going through it. So you're going to want to, if you're not a professional at that, you're going to want to talk to a professional. Um, so some of the ones that, like this is a, a good one with, um, since it's steep, it has, it has a, a downspout and then inter, uh, rocks, the uh, rip wrap, back rip wrap to um, to disperse energy at the end so it doesn't just keep digging out the, the soil and this is another good one energy dissipation with the rocks underneath and it's it's armor this is not a good one um, it's obviously it's perched and so the, the, it's not set to grade and that's just going to cause a big erosion problem and it's not armor either uh, same, this is basically the same issue, except actually that was second grade. Um, so the practical reason to put in good crossings is so that your road doesn't blow out. And um, obviously this is bad. Don't put your generator, your, your gas pumps, or anything else right next to the stream. And then wherever you do put them, you're going to need to have secondary containment that will be enough to hold all of the all the, the fluid that might come out of it. Um, so we're committed to working with people who want to become compliant. Um, uh, we expect compliance to be reached as soon as possible, depending on, especially depending on the severity of it. So um, cultivation areas that, that look pretty bad, um, or that actually don't look that bad. But basically, cultivation area will often dictate the expected remedial action. So if you have 
a site that looks pretty good and you just need to replace some culverts over time, then we would be able to work with you on a timeline. Um, if there are areas that are really worrisome that need to be fixed right away, then they're going to need to be fixed right away. And um, this is my colleague's thought, but I agree with it, that um, you should, you know, environmental protection is basically a, a cost of doing business. Um, for a lot of other uh, industries, it's the same thing, you know. So this is not specific to cannabis cultivation. It's just what, um, what industry people have to do. So here, this is my contact information at the top. Corey, so if you are north of Highway 20, you would probably contact me or the Eureka office. If you're south of Highway 20, it would be Corinne Gray or the Napa office, and um, we'll be at the back if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I call upon the stakeholder board now. Jeff Box, one the presenter. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Parks. I'm at the Division of Water Rights and the State Water Board. How many people out here are all set with your water rights? Got all your water rights totally ready to go. <laughs> How many of you are very nervous about the water rights aspects of cannabis cultivation? Surprise! A lot more hands this morning. I think a lot of you are raising your hands. Um, water rights and the cannabis cultivation uh, has been very interesting, especially because we've just been in this field since last July. So we're catching up really fast. Anybody that's worked with the state knows that the state doesn't move very fast. So we're trying really hard. But I'm going to present to you a couple things today. Uh, the first thing I'm going to present is an overview of what we're doing, bigger picture for some of the requirements under the Medical Cannabis Regulatory Safety Act. Um, and then also a little bit about what you guys need to know now for water rights and some upcoming deadlines. So, in general, and this, a lot of this comes from Senate Bill 837, also known as the, the Medical Cannabis Regulatory Safety Act. Uh, that created some legislation that charged the Water Board, working closely with our sister agency, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, to develop what they call principles and guidelines. It's basically new statewide water quality policy. And that's going to cover everything from water rights, water diversions, to all the other kind of non-flow water quality aspects of cannabis cultivation. And, and for those of you concerned about some of the information in the slides, these, these slides will be posted. I believe Mendocino County is going to post these slides. Um, hopefully the same with Fish and Game and any of the other, sorry, Fish and Wildlife or any of the other uh, slides you see today. So don't worry too much about getting some of this information, especially the contact stuff. We've got flyers in the back with all the contact information. So don't panic if you see a phone number or something and don't catch it. The main thing, the principles and guidelines are charged with protecting, are protecting uh, aquatic habitats in general, and it calls out springs, wetlands, and um, it does also call out groundwater extractions. For those of you familiar with water rights, groundwater is not a traditional, uh, traditionally under the purview of water rights. We only deal with surface water. But we've been told that we need to make sure that we're not affecting the quality of groundwater. So, so we're, we're touching on groundwater here. Here's the kind of overall picture of, of what we're working on. In the center is the policy, the principles and guidelines that the State Water Board is working on related to that. We're working on a small irrigation use registration program. Some of you in this area may be familiar with this. It's mostly uh, if you're in the southeast part of Mendocino County, there's an existing small irrigation use registration program. Most of the state doesn't have that. So we're working on getting that applied to statewide for cannabis cultivation. It's a new water right registration. And it should be available this fall. We'll get more into that in a little bit. 
The other part of our policy is working on the waste discharge requirements. Again, up here, many of you are familiar with those because the North Coast Regional Board has had waste discharge requirement programs for a few years now, but we're doing this statewide. So most of the state doesn't have any kind of waste discharge requirements for cannabis cultivation. Now all of this, especially our principles and guidelines, is going to get wrapped into food and agriculture's cultivation permits that they will be issuing starting hopefully this January. And we'll, we'll hear from food and agriculture in a little bit. I've touched on this a little bit. Some main requirements that are going to be in the principles and guidelines. Surface water flow, one of the big things that we're assuming and that you'll be able to see publicly very soon is that we're going to be looking at establishing a dry season. Most streams and most water rights in general already have some aspect of this, but what we're going to be establishing is some type of non-diversion storage during the, or non-diversion period during the summer when people would be required to water from storage only. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get into some of the non-flow requirements, but those mainly have to do with some of the topics that you've already seen in the waste discharge requirements. Um, this is the important part, and this is what, if you get anything from this today, it's that we've got important things coming out very soon. In May, we're going to be releasing the draft of our, of our policy. Um, it's going to have a 60-day comment period. We need everybody here to be able to be reviewing that and giving us your comments, because unless we hear from you what we're doing right or what we're doing wrong, it's not going to get changed and it's going to keep moving forward how we have it. So we need to hear from everybody. We need to know what you need to see in this. Within that comment period, we are going to have a, a meeting in Sacramento to discuss this. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have satellite meetings, you know, doing outreach further out in the state. This is statewide, but we're recognizing a lot of this is focused on the North Coast just because this is where it is right now. And it's also you're thinking about which counties are going to allow it, it's mostly North Coast counties. And then this October, we're hoping to bring the policy actually to our board to be adopted, and that would put it into effect. It's about the same time that you would see the small irrigation uh, water use registration coming into effect. And, and one thing I'll touch on at the end of this, we do have an email subscription list. So we, we have information in the back of the room on a flyer. Um, very important, if you can, sign up for that. Get someone you know to sign up for that, so they can let you know. If you don't use email, don't use the internet, because that's where we're going to be delivering a lot of this information when it does come out. How do you know if you need a water right? If you think you need a water right, you probably do. Um, if you divert from surface water, you probably need a water right. Probably was in here, we took it out. They said, just said, you need a water right. There is nuances, there is all kinds of ifs and ands. It's safer to assume you do and talk to us and figure out if you're in one of those nuances that doesn't. One main one that's come up in the past is fully contained springs, springs that don't run off your property. Those, are, those have not been required to get a water right in the past. What we're going to be doing and releasing pretty soon here is some forms so that people that have springs like this will be able to basically notify the water board that they have a spring, that they're not required to file a water right for it, but they're notifying of, us of the fact. That way you have something to show to food and agriculture that you've contacted us and that you know you, you at least have some verification of whether you need a water right or not. Another reason to be on our email subscription list is info on that's going to be coming out hopefully in the next couple weeks. 
if you live in anywhere that diverts off the Russian River or any of the North Coast streams in Mendocino County, uh, you may be aware of the existing small irrigation use registration program. It's in uh, what's called the policy area. It's related to Santa Bill 2121. If you live in it, you probably know about it. If you don't, don't worry about it. But if, if you do live in that area, I, I know where the, these meetings are being held in Ukiah and in Fort Bragg tomorrow, so it kind of applies more to them. But so it's important information for anybody in, in the southeast part of Mendocino. Another thing that has come up a lot, a couple years ago, a lot of cannabis cultivators were told to get small irrigation and use registrations. The legislation that passed last year kind of changed that, especially when you add the commercial aspect. Small domestic use registrations are for, like it says, domestic use. It's for incidental irrigation. As soon as you add commercial into that, it, it makes this invalid. So this may be valid for the, your personal grows, for you know, your under medical or under the recreational. But as soon as you add anything to do with commercial, it doesn't apply. So this is a good message for anybody that has applied for a small domestic for your cannabis cultivation in the past. You're gonna to need to migrate into our small irrigation program. There's a couple ways that you can get a water right registration. Right now, the one thing we have available, if you are a recurring water right converter, which means if you have a stream or a spring, it's beautifully raining right now. If, if you have a, a stream or a spring uh, that goes through your property and you're diverting water from it, you need to be reporting that to us. It's, it doesn't cost anything. It's, you need to file a, a initial statement of irrigation, or I'm sorry, in an initial statement of water diversion and use. Um, eventually, when the small irrigation program is available, we'll be migrating people to that. It's a little frustrating because we have a lot of things that are under development. I don't like sending things that are like, oh, coming soon, coming soon. It's just a reality of what we have right now. But it is important, and it is actually state law, that if you are diverting under riparian claim right now, regardless of what you're using it for, you should be filing it with the state. And that applies to everybody, regardless of cannabis cultivation or not. <coughs> Again, small domestic use registration is not going to be valid for, for food and agriculture licensing. One thing we are developing is an online portal to be actually to apply for the small irrigation <coughs> program this fall. You can apply and then get confirmation of it online. Hopefully we'll have a water quality aspect of that as well. <coughs> One thing we're kind of asking, how many people would be interested in having the ability to pay for all these things online? Yeah? That's good. Uh, you know, we're just trying to get a feel because it's... Grants are good too. Give us a bag. <laughs> we're, we're just trying to get a feel if it is worth our time to make sure that happens. And it, it seems like it is, but that's one of the things we're working towards is making sure people can be able to pay for things online if they need to. And, and one thing too, I'm sure, I know everybody's very concerned about all the fees associated with these programs. I know there's fees on top of fees on top of fees. There may be fees associated with this program. We don't know what they are yet. They're being developed. They'll have the opportunity for public review when they do come up. Here's another important point. There is part of the legislation that says if you fall into some of these categories, especially if you're filing and going to be diverting under a repairing claim, you need to have that filed with us before July 1st of this year. If you're going to be getting a small irrigation use registration, if you're pretty sure that that's how you're going to have to go, and we think the majority of people are going to have to do the small irrigation and use program, you, you, you don't need to worry about this July 1st deadline. But if you're not sure, make sure to talk with us, make sure to get in contact, ask us. I don't want to see anybody 
not be able to get a food and agriculture cultivation license just because they missed this deadline. And it's not a very well-known deadline. It's something that's buried in legislation and in statutes. I don't think many people are staying up late reading California Water Code. And again, just so you remember, all this stuff is, is on handouts. I actually have a copy of all this. This is the actual language. Um, this is in the back, it's on the back of our handout, so you can see what it actually says. So, right now, be looking for some new forms coming out in the next couple weeks. Uh, if you have a riparian water right claim, or you are using water under required riparian water use, make sure to get that claim into us. We'll have our contact information back there. Can you give you an idea of just kind of where you fit into the, the statewide scheme uh, going forward? Mendocino County is kind of right in the middle of two different regions. It's for the same region I talked reason I talked about e earlier. Part of you is part of the southeast part of Mendocino County has a specific policy applied to it. The other half is going to be generally in the north coast. So this is this is exactly what the in-stream flow policy area looks like. So we're right here. So if you're diverting, it generally, if you're diverting from the eel, one of the watersheds in the eel, you're in the northern part, you're not in the policy area. If you're diverting, diverting from one of the coastal streams or from the Russian River, uh, make sure to ask us about the existing in-stream flow policy area and the registration program there. Just for more information, so you know that you guys are in a special county, the, the South Fork Hill River is also what's known as a priority stream under the California Water Action Plan. It's a plan that was put out a couple of years ago by the governor um, trying to address some of the water needs of the state. South Bay Fork Eel has a lot of studies upcoming on it. It doesn't really mean anything for you except to just be aware that there's a lot of attention on Mendocino County because you guys have a lot of great rivers. Let's see what that means water right wise. And, then, and this is our, our contact information. I don't expect anyone to be writing this down. Please get a handout from the back to get all this information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Our next presenter is going to be from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Connor McEntee. I'm an environmental scientist with the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. I'm sure that a lot of you guys recognize me. I've been uh, doing this for a couple of years now. Um, kind of helped to frame some of the uh, uh, regulatory work uh, that has taken a little bit more of a shape here uh, recently. Um, what I handed out to you guys was our notice of intent and our monitoring form along with the fee schedule uh, for our regulatory program that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, many of you may have already filled this out and so it might be a little bit of repetition for you, a little extra paperwork. A lot of you guys use wood burning stoves for heat so you know, feel free to use it for kindling or whatever you need it for if you haven't, if you've already filled it out. Um, but uh, this is what I use as my prop to, to, uh, to talk about, so I'm going to go with this. Um, this is the contact information for myself and Shan Nutley is a geologist. She's in the back over there in the green. Um, she's new to the unit but not new to the board, so she should be able to answer a lot of questions for you guys uh, if you have any other specific ones beyond what I go over here. Uh, and that's the website, which is also in all this paperwork as well, repeated it several times. Um, all right, so I'm going to just kind of go over um, our regulatory structure for our program. Uh, Jeff did a pretty good job of talking about what the charge of the State Water Board is, so I don't really need to repeat some of that information. You guys kind of understand uh, that our mission is to preserve, enhance, and protect waters, beneficial uses of waters in the state. Um, and our regulatory authority comes from the California Water Code and the Port of Cologne Act. Um, so that's where we're coming from with our regulatory authority. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the way we interpret that 
and we put that into a regulatory program, the cannabis program, uh, which is uh, which was passed in August of 2015 by our board, uh, and provides the framework that I'm going to talk about. So, um, there's a fact sheet on the back. This thing's the very back, and there's an overview of the order. So I'm going to go over that, and I'll walk through the paperwork pretty quickly. So the overview of the order. We have three tiers in our regulatory program. Um, tier one is a low threat tier based on compliance with standard conditions and site characteristics. The site characteristics are you have to be cultivating less than 5,000 square feet of total cultivated area. We measure the cultivated area by disturbed area. So ground disturbance, not canopy, like the county does, I believe. Um, no cultivation on slopes greater than 35%. So if you're looking, you know, you want your slopes, you're looking up, up at your native slope, so if it wasn't a cultivation area there, what would be the native slope? Doesn't, it needs to be less than 35%. No cultivation areas associated, or associated facilities located within 200 feet of a water course, or any water body. So if you have cultivation occurring within 200 feet of a water body, so a wetland or a water course, anything like that, that would be considered jurisdictional by the state, um, then you're not in tier one. And we also don't want you diverting surface water from May 15th to October 31st. Um, so no, no surface diversion if you're going to be in Tier 1. Um, this, the standard conditions that you need to comply with are, I'm going to jump down to number 2 real quick uh, on this sheet. So the standard conditions uh, are they're listed down here from A through L. So the first one is site maintenance, erosion control, and drainage features. So that's your your road system, we want your roads to be maintained properly, we want them to be draining properly, we want them to be hydrologically disconnected. So we want, uh, we want you to be putting in rolling dips at appropriate places, we want you to be putting drainage relief uh, so that you're getting that water off of the road system uh, and back onto the native slope uh, so that it's not you know, gullying out your road and going down delivering sediments, kind of some of the pictures that Angela talked about. Stream crossing maintenance and improvement. Your streams need to be sized properly for 100 year flow events. Um, so, you know, the calculations need to be done. They need to be at, at, an, appropriate, uh, at an appropriate slope and, and, uh, and installed properly so that they are they're passing water appropriately and not causing erosion to happen within the water course. Stream and wetland buffers. So that's, you know, following the compliance of the, of the buffer distances for depending on what tier that you're in and also having those buffers being natively vegetated uh, properly maintained. Uh, spoils management, so that's if you are, um, if you are, if you do have a cultivation area that you've kind of cleared, you've graded that area, you want the spoils from that, from that work that you've done to be managed properly. Um, disposed of properly, spread back out properly so they're not ending up in the water course. Water storage and use, we want to make sure that you guys are using water at agronomic rates, that you have appropriate water storage for what it is that you guys are looking at uh, for your cultivation purposes. Uh, we want you irrigating at agronomic rates. We want you uh, to be, you know, putting in measures that's uh, not causing irrigation runoff to happen. So if it's either straw mulching on top of your on top of your beds, or um, you know, you have you have your your soil contained in such a manner to where that irrigation runoff isn't going to go down into the creek. Part of that is having that buffer as well. Um, fertilizers and soil amendments. So those are being used at agronomic rates. Are being utilized appropriately. They're being stored properly. You're not just leaving open fertilizer bags right next to the creek and allowing that to end up in the watershed. Pesticides. If you are using any pesticides, there's a short list of approved pesticides, I believe, by the Department of Pesticide Regulation, that they are being, they're approved pesticides if you are using them, and that you are uh, applying them at appropriate rates, and you're storing all that appropriately in, in proper containment, secondary containment. Petroleum products and other chemicals, we want those to be stored and maintained properly. So if you have a 55 gallon uh, or 110 gallon uh, you know, diesel container that you've got, uh, you have appropriate catchment underneath that diesel container so you're able to catch all that extra, like if, if it were to fail, you're able to catch that diesel so it doesn't end up infiltrating into the groundwater, getting into the, um, getting into the surface waters. Uh, cultivation related waste, so your soils, your spent soils, what are you doing with those? Are you composting them? Are you stockpiling them somewhere and you know, uh, uh, turning them over in the wintertime? Are they being covered properly so that they're not going to end up again in the water course? Um, 
refuse and human waste. So we don't want trash, garbage, all over your property end up in the water course. Uh, so make sure that that's being, disposed of, that's being disposed of properly. And then human waste, which needs to comply with local county standards. So whatever the on-site waste treatment system policy is for, for the county, or septic system, which is generally um, what most of the counties around the North Coast have, <coughs> septic, you know, needs to be septic, it needs to be approved uh, by the county. Um, and then if you have any remediation, cleanup, and restoration activities, that those are being done properly, they're being uh, they're being done by professionals, um, and that it's being done in a timely manner. So if you're in compliance with all those things, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things, and you're meeting all the other conditions on the site, um, less than 5,000 square feet, not greater than 35% slopes, further than 200 feet away, no surface water diversion, then you'd be tier one. Tier two is a management tier, and that's for operations that don't meet all the standard conditions or all those site conditions. Um, and so if you're not, if you don't qualify for tier one, then you're, like, you're going to likely qualify for tier two. That's where the bulk of everybody is going to be. It's where you have some work to do. You have, a, you have 180 days from the submission of this once you check off of your tier two uh, to develop a water resource protection plan. That plan is basically like your farm plan. You're putting in, okay, these are, I've got three culverts on my property. I've got to fix two of them. I'm going to fix the first one in year one. I'm, I'm going to fix the second one in year two, and this is the way in which I'm going to fix it. Uh, I'm going to put rolling dips in on my road. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be adding storage tanks. I'm going to be, you know, whatever it is that you're going to be doing, we want that to be outlined and we want the timeline that it's going to be outlined in um, uh, for having to be done. Uh, you have up to five years to fix everything that's on your property. Um, and currently that includes, it's, it's the entirety of your property, so it's not just your cultivation site, it's the, within the parcel boundaries of your property. So if you, are in if you are in compliance with all the standard conditions, you're just slightly larger than 5,000 square feet, um, you can potentially qualify as a tier two star, which basically just gives you a fee reduction, knowing that you guys are doing all the right things, but you just don't fit into the parameters of tier one. Um, that also includes a, a, a variation on your water use plan. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be in forbearance for the whole summertime, uh, but that you are in compliance with some water plan, water use plan. And then tier three is a cleanup tier that's for, that's for problematic sites, things that need to be fixed immediately, um, that we have a higher level of oversight that we need to deal with uh, in terms of reviewing plans. Likely it's going to involve some level of engineering. Um, and that's you know, uh, going to be a lot more labor intensive on our end and a lot more oversight on our end. Um, the majority of folks are, generally speaking, tier two. So. Um, that's where you that's where you're likely to be um, uh, enrollment in this order is accomplished by submitting this paperwork and submitting the required fee um, uh, the, if you are enrolling initially for the first time this year you submit this to, our, to the North Coast Regional Office um, all of the paperwork including the fee if you're if you enrolled last year and you're renewing your enrollment um, you submit the monitoring form to us and you submit the fee to Sacramento and you should have received an invoice. Um, then it should hopefully be coming soon if you haven't received an invoice. It should hopefully be coming soon. And that's at the state level. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the framework of the order. So then I'm just going to walk through the paperwork real quick. So Appendix A, you're filling out your first name, last name, mailing address, city, state, zip, phone number, email. Uh, try and get as, as much of your contact information as possible so they have a variety of methods to be able to get a hold of you. Uh, your site information, same thing, city, street, state, zip, um, your APN number, and if you can, figure it out what sub-watershed you're in. If you can't, you can call our offices and we can try and figure that out for you as well, but there's also a website that's available here for you to look up. Then you check what tier you're in, and then you sign it. Appendix C, this is your monitoring form. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the site map, so that'll be the second page of Appendix C. Um, in the site map, we want to have a lot of the same things that the county's going to require on your site map, so like, and if you give us more information, things that the county requires that we don't require, like your 
you know, setbacks from property boundaries, things like that, that may be required for the county, that's fine. We can, we can interpret that. So if you want to just make one map that encompasses all the requirements, that's fine for us. Um, so we want to see the property topography. We want to see the perimeter of the land owned or leased. We want to see water courses and stream crossings, roads, clearings, developed areas, perimeters of cultivation areas, water source types and locations, nutrient and chemical storage locations, buildings, garbage, refuse storage facilities and locations, human waste facilities, locations, unstable earthen features, soil or spoil storage or stockpiles, controllable sediment discharge sites, so anything like you know, rolling dips, things you're putting into your roads like that, um, we want those marked on the map as well. Um, uh, and then create a legend as well. Can we add an extra page so we have all the draw Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can and you can add attachments to all all this stuff. These? Yeah. Yeah, we have several more over there. Sure. So then monitoring inspections. Um, you need to be inspecting your property periodically throughout the winter. Um, that's where most of the potential damage can occur is when rainfall is happening and uh, those concentrated rain events can cause some of the damage to happen. So we really want people to be paying attention to what's going on, taking taking interim measures over the winter time to help mitigate any you know emergency actions that need to happen um, if if erosion is occurring, if if uh, um, if problems are occurring throughout the winter time. So. Uh, a couple of times specifically that we want you to be monitoring uh, before and after your, any significant alteration or upgrade to a given stream crossing. Uh, we want you to be monitoring what the location looks like before, what it looks like after, and we want you to be contacting us as well. Um, it's in those specific times that you're going to you know, be needing to talk to us in the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, so that's if you're increasing the size of the culvert or you're, you're going to recontour it for your uh, um, for your critical dips, things like that. We want to be knowing uh, what's going on. Uh, the inspections should include photographic documentation with photo records to be kept on site. Uh, also, prior to October 15th uh, of every year to evaluate the site preparedness for storm events. Um, so just making sure that everything's all tightened up before wintertime hits. Uh, and then again by December 15th so that you've seen a couple of rain events generally by December 15th and you can just know that Things are, you know, are holding holding together just fine. And then following any rainfall event with an intensity of three inches of precipitation within 24 hours. So if you have a large rain event, we want you to be out there, uh, you know, monitoring the site, making sure that nothing has happened to it. You're clearing out any culverts that might have been clogged with debris or sediment, things like that, so to allow it to continue to be able to function throughout the winter time. So annually, annual reporting, we want, this needs to be turned in annually by March 31st. Um, and you can submit that to the regional board directly or via email. Um, so the reporting form starts on the next page. Um, your site WDID number, that's your identification number that we'll give you guys once you enroll with us. Your sub-watershed number, it's, you can find that out on the website, it's listed in Appendix A. And then whatever your enrollment date was, the first time that you submitted it, uh, so if you're submitting this for the first time, this whole package, you put your enrollment date down as whatever the date is that you're submitting it along, and that should be the same date as your reporting date. And then annually after that, you put down what your initial enrollment date is, and then what your reporting date is for this, this coming year. Again, check what tier you're in. And then, um, Starting at F, it's just this is a way to walk through that you're meeting all those conditions that I talked about. So in tier one, it's just there's a checkbox for are you meeting X, Y, and Z characteristic of, of what it is to be tier one. And then tier two, it's the same thing, walking through all those checkboxes. Um, and then there's the standard conditions on the next page, it talks about all the different standard conditions in tier two, checking yes or no, if no, what's going to be data compliance. Uh, and then and then it asks you how are things going with your water resource protection plan and see here and then if you are going to be doing work in stream we want you to answer not D to D here and if you are doing work in stream then it's asking you uh, are you do you have plans that you develop and you submit those plans to the board so that we can review and approve those plans and then
then it asks you questions if you feel you fall, fall under tier two star, asks you those questions there. In order to be tier two star, you need to have a site inspection by either us or an approved third party. And for tier three sites, you know, as we develop a cleanup and restoration plan, um, and has that been approved by us, and we begin work on that. So if you are a tier three site and you need a cleanup and restoration plan, you only have 45 days to complete that. Then we're just asking for the numbers on everything that's, again, reflective of the qualitative questions that we asked. So, what's your total cultivation area? What's your distance to surface waters? What's the average slope of each cultivation area? What's the total number of road crossings? What's your annual soil amendment and chemical use? Um, what's your total surface water diversion by month? What's your total water, uh, your water input to storage by source? What, what's your water use by month? Um, and it's asking you for the source and the amount per month. And that's it, that's the form. Um, this isn't a paperwork exercise though. Oh. You know, we want you guys actually to be being honest about this stuff, being honest about the work that needs to be done and getting the work done. Uh, and we're gonna be utilizing this you know, to prioritize inspections for folks um, so that we can verify that this is actually happening. Um, so that, that the work is being done properly. So that's, you know, we're gonna be using this information to prioritize our inspections in between between this review of aerial imagery, et cetera, so that we can figure out um, you know, where we need to be going, how we need to be prioritizing what it is that we're doing. So it's important for you guys to be honest so that we can do our work appropriately, and it's important for you guys to be getting that work done so that when we get out on site, there aren't problems. Uh, thanks very much. We tried to get most of them up on this slide, um, but inevitably we probably left a couple people off. The State Water Resources Control Board oversees water rights and water quality issues. The regional boards are not, they don't have a program everywhere throughout the state, so the state board is creating a statewide uh, general order that Jeff talked about for water quality issues. Uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulation will be providing guidance um, on pesticide use in cannabis. Um, and it is a short list right now, um, but there is a process for expanding that list. 
Um, and we're actually the only state that has a different department for the ag and then pesticide use. Um, about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, California decided it probably wasn't a good idea for the department that protects and promotes agriculture to also regulate pesticide use. We could probably get up to a good doing that. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, you heard from Angela earlier today about certain permits that you might need for a state cultivation license. Uh, the Department of Justice, everyone applying for a state license in 2018 will get a background check, um, anyone who's an owner of a license. Cal OSHA, so once you're a licensed business within California, you're subject to worker safety laws just like anybody else. City, county, there's a lot of different local things going on right now. Your county ag commissioner's office is hosting this workshop. Um, there you're starting a permitting process, and they are quite a ways ahead from a lot of other local agencies. Uh, there's a department of technology that oversees departments within the state um, who are putting up big technology projects. They are holding our hands through the process so that we don't mess anything up. We'll see how that goes. Um, Treasurer's office doles out funds for us. The Board of Equalization is, we meet with regularly to discuss tax issues. The Medical Board of California, licensing physicians, patients, caregivers, and then the Governor's office likes to check in on us regularly to make sure we're not going rogue or anything like that. Uh, here's a quick overview of licenses that will be issued by the CDFA in 2018. Um, for each size, there's an outdoor, indoor, and mixed light. There's specialty cottage, they're the smallest, specialty, small, medium, large, and nurseries. And so medium, large, and nursery are in red because they have some special considerations. The medium type, um, my department is actually required to limit the number of those that we issue. Um, and the criteria for how we limit that will be in our regulations, which we'll be releasing soon. The large type is only in the adult use law, Prop 64, um, and that we're not issuing until 2023, so we're not going to worry about it yet. Yes, in the back? Are those um, canopy or cultivation? They are canopy, as defined by CDFA, which will be in our regulations, coming out soon. Um, and then the nursery license has no canopy limit. So our regulations that are coming out soon, April, I, I promise, actually. I can say that with confidence that April they will be out there. Um, we'll have definitions to help us ensure we uniformly implement the program statewide. The application, so you can see everything that's going to be required in an application. And actually, if you're compliant with all of the agencies here, you're a, a ways ahead. Like, that's a huge portion of our application. Licensing will contain information such as fees um, and specific requirements that there need to be renewed annually, stuff like that. Site-specific requirements, so depending on if you're an indoor, outdoor greenhouse, um, you might have different things that you have to follow. Uh, records that you'll have to keep, track and trace, that's one of the systems that we have to implement and that will track the product from seed to sale. How we're going to conduct inspections and then enforcement. And in-house in our office, we like to call that the compliance unit. We understand this is going to be a process and you know, we're not in it to like give you a license and then immediately revoke it, unless you're really bad. Okay, so where we are now, um, we are getting ready to release our draft regulations um, in April. I know that April's almost done. Um, there will be a 45-day public comment period where we would love to get your input on maybe we were way off on something and if you could provide us how we could improve that, that would be great. Um, we'll consider every comment we receive, make revisions, and then go back out for comment or for public comment periods as necessary. And we'd like to adopt final regulations in late 2017 so that we can start accepting applications in January 2018. And that's we're moving forward with the medical statute first, um, just because we were already working on it. And adult use, we're going to use what's called the emergency rulemaking authority. Um, cultivation is cultivation in our minds, so the components will probably be the same. Um, so if you're planning on only being a recreational producer, don't worry, the medical application will be very similar to the recreational one. Same thing, once you do an emergency rulemaking though, you have to go through the regular process um, and get the regulations permanent. We're also working on a compliance handbook, which will be a tool for growers 
Um, it'll have actually a checklist for filling out our application. My boss, Amber Morris, likes to say that it's something you can put on your fridge and like check off something you did that day. Um, and, and being here, again, and being compliant with all the agencies here, you actually just checked off quite a big piece of that checklist. Um, we also are going to have information on all the additional laws uh, that apply to cultivators like how OSHA information and local contacts and how much things may cost from other agencies. So you can have a one-stop shop for really good guidance. Uh, protection of the environment is paramount. Uh, we're in the middle of drafting a programmatic environmental impact report. Uh, it should be released, a draft should be released in June. Um, we started this whole process for medical in April of last year, and then when Prop 64 passed and changed the scope, we have to kind of start over our CEQA, uh, California Environmental Quality Act um, analysis timeline. So we are going to be coming out with a new um, process, but we're still anticipating everything that is certified and ready to go by 2018. Uh, and so a lot of the analysis that we put in for medical, we can still use moving forward with Prop 64 analysis, so it didn't set us back too much, but it did a little bit. And what it's going to provide are different mitigations that may apply to different types of cultivation sites. You can see how indoor like, energy used to be very different than outdoor water impacts. Our technology projects, um, we have two to get up by 2018. One's our online licensing system. You will have an option of applying online or by paper. Uh, online would make it a lot easier for us and would make things faster, but paper if you want. Um, and our track and trace system, which would track uh, cannabis from seed to sale, and we'll have details about when you would need to log information into that system in our regulations coming out soon. The one system, even though CDFA is paying for it, is will have to be used by all of the licensing agencies, so the Bureau and Department of Public Health. Um, it's a very much a collaborative effort. And each plant is gonna be issued a unique ID, and since we're still in the process of procuring our vendor for track and trace, we don't know what that unique ID is going to look like right yet. Some things to consider, we're almost done. Um, the way medical law is written, there is dual licensure, so you do have to go get a local license or permit before coming to the state. Under Prop 64, it's not quite that clear. Um, and then to make it even more fun, the governor's office and legislator are in the process of aligning the two laws so that we only have one by the end of the year. So we're not quite sure what the final law is going to be, um, but we'll be ready for you guys 2018. Uh, I'll, I'll try. Um, federal status, there's still a lot of question marks. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we're supposed to just keep going ahead, business as usual, until otherwise. Cool. Uh, we have no idea of the number of licensees to expect, um, so there's a lot of issues with that and kind of funding a, a program. <coughs> Enforcement, we are only responsible for licensed cultivators, so after 2018, people become licensed. If you're not, you're not under the jurisdiction of CDFA, and you could potentially meet law enforcement. Uh, <laughs> And as always, we try to find a balance. Um, it's not easy. There's so many things to consider, changing laws, um, an industry that's raring to go, uh, state government that's slow, and um, we'll get there. This is our contact information. I have this on a card in the back, so if you don't, don't worry about writing it down, it's all in the back. And that's it. All right. We, we now have uh, the county department agencies coming in, this is the planning and building services. We're going to give the presentation. Thank you. Sam, Connie, Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mandy. I'm from the planning and building services department, and with me is my colleague, Monique. She's also a planner. Um, just a little disclaimer before I start. Unfortunately, we don't have any people from the building division of our department here today. They weren't able to attend. So if you have questions regarding your buildings, your greenhouses, things such as that, unfortunately you'll have to call our office and speak with the building inspector, come in and speak with one. Um, just a quick overview of our department. There's four divisions. There's the planning division, 
the building division, the code enforcement division, and the administration division. You will be working closely with planning and building, hopefully not code enforcement. Um, our role with regards to this medical cannabis cultivation ordinance, um, when you submit your application with the Department of Agriculture, they are going to refer the application to our department and we will check your zoning, provide you with a sheet of paper that says your zoning is checks out, and that will be all we really do, unless you need an administrative permit, which we have at, the, um, at our desk back there. Okay, so our, how do I go back? Just roll, roll, roll. I'm rolling. So our, our supervisors uh, that you'll want to contact for regarding cannabis regulations are Nash Gonzalez, he's our interim director. Um, our chief planner is Mary Lynn Hunt. Our chief building inspector is Mike Lockett, and the code enforcement supervisor is Lisa Washburn. Vandy and I are planners that will be working directly with cannabis, and uh, Rich Swanson is the plans examiner who we'll want to reach out to. So back at our table, we have this handout. We have this cultural resources handout. It folds into a trifold packet so you can take it with you, but it's going to explain what cultural resources you might encounter on your site when you're doing any kind of excavation or ground disturbance. Um, this could range from arrowheads or glass bottles. You can find ceramics, um, but you might also find human remains. So it, just, it defines the difference between human remains and material remains, and then there's going to be discovery protocols that outline what to do in case you think you might have found, found something on your site. Um, the thing to remember is if you do think you found something, you'll need to cease and desist immediately and stop any um, groundwork or excavation that's going on because you could face um, fines or jail time because it's a misdemeanor charge. So Vandy will go on to... Oh, and one more thing I wanted to point out. In your handbooks, this could solve a lot of confusion that you're going to encounter when you see this page. There's a page called the property profile. It's in the middle of your, pa in, of your packet. And this is an internal document. It's a sample just for you to see what we're going to be sending to the ag department. This is not something that you'll need to fill out on your own. So if you want to make a note that you do not need to fill out the property profile by yourself. So, one of the documents you'll be submitting with your application to the Department of Agriculture is this site plan. And in the packet there is the site plan requirements, it has a list of what we would like to see on the site plan. But just to keep in mind, certain things that we definitely need to see. Um, one is the legal parcel configuration. We understand that some of you are, in, are on parcels that are 200, 400 acres and the cultivation site's going to be a little tiny dot. That's okay. We just want to see where, on relative to your whole parcel, you're cultivating. Um, for both existing and proposed structures, we need to see where they are and we need to see their distances from property lines and from other structures, particularly the barns and the greenhouses. Um, oh. And we will be checking for permitted buildings. Um, if you do have unpermitted buildings, we currently have an amnesty program that goes until June 30th. And what that does is it prevent, or it releases you from paying your violation fees that you would have had to pay if we didn't have the amnesty. Another thing we definitely need to see on your site plan is the actual cultivation site and where that's going to be. And included in that, if you are doing an outdoor cultivation site, is the security fence around that site. Um, other things, ponds, if you have ponds, roads that you use to access your property, we'd like to see those as well. And the last slide we have, um, we have a handout for this in the back as well, but if you would like to look up your zoning on our website, you are actually able to do that. So the screenshot on the left is our home page, which is at co.mendocino.ca.us slash planning. And on the left side menu, or the, on the left hand side is a menu of options. And the first one is zoning lookup. 
And if you click that, it will bring you to a new page, which is this uh, right side. And there's two drop-down menus. The first one allows you to select between your address or your parcel number. And the next one is kind of just a range in which it's looking for. Um, we recommend that for the range, you put contains, because our site is very sensitive to the information you're putting in that search bar, and a lot of people have reported to us that the site is broken. It's not broken, it's just very sensitive to what you put into it. Um, again, we do have use permits and admin permits in the back if you know that you would need one. And, do you have anything? And yeah, just to reiterate, the property profile is not something that you will need to fill out. That is something that we will be doing internally. So please do not come to the office asking for one. We will not be giving one. Uh, and then there's VH. And you have Dave here from VH who's going to speak to a couple of things. Thank you very much. Uh, can we hold the questions till afterwards? Yeah, it's, kind of, it's kind of house rules, not my rules. It's been an hour and a half. Whoa, you, and I don't see anybody as sleepy. It's incredible. And sometimes it seems like the, the baby is parroting what we're saying, blah, 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 blah. So I really appreciate all you folks hanging in as long as you have. Uh, we're near the end. I'm Dave Jensen. I'm the Environmental Health Director for the county. And this is real simple for us. We treat all of you, um, everybody who's a cannabis grower gets treated the same as everybody else. No special rules for cannabis growers. We try to keep it real simple. Our two primary interests for cultivators are wells and septics. That's it. Just like everybody else in the county, wells and septics. I want to say uh, a couple of... Vandy just mentioned that there's an amnesty program that's going on right now until June 30th. I'm hoping that we can extend that. We had an amnesty program that some of you probably uh, entered into back in 2010 after the complex fires, the fire complex, whatever that was. Um, the same rules this time around. Uh, we're trying to get you to, we're trying to make it easier to legalize your structures and your septic systems. If you, uh, and I have the handout back in the back table there that, that'll explain the septic process. If you have a septic system in the ground, it may be good enough already. What you need to do is hire a qualified site evaluator. That's someone who's uh, a septic designer. That's a term of art. And, there, and, and I was, as I was here today listening to everyone, I realized that there are not enough words in the English language, ironically, because we're both using the same types of terms. Site evaluator, property this, site that, and they have very different meanings. For, for the environmental health, a qualified site evaluator is a septic designer, and my list of site evaluators will do only that. They will only evaluate your soils for septic. They won't evaluate your site for compliance with grows or any other purpose. We're, we're a one-trick pony, septics, qualified site evaluators, septics. So you hire one of these people, and if you enter into a contract prior to June 30th, the septic design process can drag on, depending on whether or not you need wet weather testing, which would take you into next year. If, just like the last time we did this, if you're on board, you're in the line, you stay in the line, even after the door closes and the lights go out. After June 30th, you will still be in the line, whether it takes it, whether it takes it, the, the person three weeks, three months, or a year and a half. To, to get your septic design approved. So, uh, I'm, and I'm hoping we can extend that, that amnesty. Let's talk about wells. Because the, the septic process is pretty well defined on the sheet I have in the back. Wells are a little bit different. There are three types of wells right now in Mendocino County. And, and, and it comes up as part of getting your property co code compliant for the purposes of getting a cultivation license. 
The three types of wells are these. There are those wells that were hand dug 40, 50, 80, 100 years ago and are still working wells. And many of you are still using those old wells. Those old three, three foot concrete well rings, or maybe they're lined with stones. They're works of art and they're still very productive, but they're obviously, or maybe not so obviously, there is no permit for them. All right? We weren't issuing permits in the 1880s or even in the 1940s. So those wells, and we will work with the people who come to your property to evaluate the, the conditions on your property for the purposes of, of compliance. We will work with those people to help them recognize those old wells that we will grandfather in. Okay? So that's class number one, the old, the old time wells. Class number two are those modern wells that were put in with a permit. We have a lot of records at our office in Ukiah and in Fort Bragg. We have better records from about 1974 on forward. There are some periods of time when uh, the records are, are, are very difficult to pull out. We will do what we can to assist you with, with demonstrating that your well is permitted and legal. If we are unable to help you with that, there's a, a, an, an organization, there's a department of the state. It's always easier to, no offense to anyone in the room, but it, you know it's always easier to work with local people than it is an, a, an office in Sacramento. So come to us first. If we can help you, we'll get you to Sacramento. We'll, we'll work through it together. Now, that's all good. The third, the third type of well are those wells which have recently been drilled without a permit. This is a very difficult situation that, that some folks may have to face. There, there are places, as one of the places this becomes very problematic are in special drilling areas, such as in the valley floor of Round Valley of Covalo. There are some areas in the Covalo region, the Hawkland region, and one other area where there is poor quality water near the surface, and then the good aquifer is down below. So when you drill a well in those special permit areas, you've got to seal off the bad water, the low quality water, so that it doesn't percolate down and pollute the low lying aquifer. In those cases, if you have a, and, and the licensed drillers know how to do that. And if you have an illegal well, a well drilled without a permit, in one of those areas, there's really nothing we can do to help you. Because unlike a septic system, I can, I can hire, you can hire someone to come out to your property, he'll put some holes in the ground, look at your soil, he'll get a tape measure and find out how long your lines are, He'll, take, he'll figure out how big your septic tank is, and he can say, this is code compliant, or this system needs another 40 feet of leach line. But when we come upon a well that was drilled without a permit, with no well log, only Superman can tell you how that well was built. And Superman doesn't work for Mendocino County, you can't afford him. So. Um, old well, and a new wells drilled without a permit uh, will most likely need to be destroyed by a licensed well driller and a new well drill. And that's the way it is. Um, so hopefully you didn't pay a lot of money to have uh, a, a, a midnight driller come and poke a hole in your property. Uh, and if you did, you may want to go uh, visit him this weekend and talk about what, where you're going to go. So I don't want to take up any more time. I know it's getting late, but again, environmental health. I see Marlena Borbonet. Mar Marlena, can you raise your hand? Marlena Borbonet is the pro land use program manager in Ukiah. Our offices are in Ukiah and Fort Bragg. And please come see us. Come talk to us. We will try to be as flexible and as reasonable as possible to help you through this process. Thank you very much, and thanks for sticking it out. Thank you, David. I call upon Daniel.
from the members of the department of agriculture to give us a presentation now. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Daniel, I work for the County Ag Department and I just am here to clarify a few parts of our application process because we're tasked with trying to keep track of where all you guys are at with all these other agencies. So, um. uh, the first thing is on our checklist to apply. Um, a big issue seems to, to be uh, proof of prior cultivation. And um, as you can see, um, now they're accepting, if you're enrolled in 931 or if you registered with the Ag Department last year and showed proof of prior cultivation, we have a spreadsheet um, of all that information internally that we can use to verify um, that you were um, cultivating. And they want, if you don't have that, they want, they, they want aerial and ground level images, but they realize that that um, it's kind of self-incriminating and that uh, a lot of people, nobody wanted ground level images of them growing pot before this. So we're trying to figure out ways and, and it's on you guys too to come up with suggestions and creative ways that you can um, uh, prove that you were cultivating. And so there's, there's you know, um, if you were working with the water board before, if you got raided before, um, if you had, if you had Consultation. If you had consultation with people, um, if you ever submitted, if you ever submitted any cannabis to the cannabis cup for a taste test or what you know, um, if you're an indoor grower and you can show that you had spikes during your growth cycle for uh, old PG&E bills, um, and then date stamp receipts of like industry standard things like big uh, uh, earth pots and, or those smart pots that you guys use. Uh, would work. Um, other people in Laytonville also uh, brought up the fact that like maybe they had um, they have rec medical records where their doctor had allowed them to grow 25 plants in the past and that's okay. That'll work too. Oh, and then there's other, you know, there's things like the Cortese list is on there, the Cortese list, and it's, it's, it's really simple to find if you Google Cal EPA Cortese and there's a, a search, that it's the top hit in a search tab, and there's two pages of contaminated sites in Mendocino County. And then a couple of other things that uh, the ordinance is requiring is, is for basically construction on new sites um, that disturb one or more acres of soil. You have to get a general, uh, it's called a, um, let's see. Um, State Water Resource Control Board general permit for discharges of storm water associated with construction activity. Construction general permit order number 2009 or 0009 DWQ. And then um, there's this other uh, non exempt activities that involve construction and waters in the U.S. Um, there's the uh, sec CWA section 401 water quality certification from the North Coast Regional Water Board. And I've been told that that's part of Appendix D in their order, so um, that should be pretty easy for you guys. Okay. All right, and now permit types. Um, type C, cottage type permits, they can be grown on any, uh, any parcel size, but obviously there's, there's a sunset on some of those. Um, and they're restricted to 25,000 or 2,500 square feet, um, where C is outdoor. And then on all the permits, the A designates an indoor grow and B designates uh, mixed light. Type 1 requires a minimum parcel size of 5 acres, and you can grow up to 5,000 square feet. Type 2, you have to have 10 acres, and you can grow up to 10,000 square feet. Uh, type 4 permits are nursery permits. Um, you can grow 22,000 square feet, and you have to be on 10 acres. Okay, and now the, uh, the ordinance also requires that you, that you turn in a cultivation and operations plan, 
and we put together a template, a questionnaire for you that'll work. If you don't like it, um, you can you have to self-generate one, but just realize that it's pretty involved. You know, um, you have to you have to prove that you're meeting the minimum legal standards for water storage, conservation, and use, drainage, runoff, erosion control, watershed and habitat protection, um, proper storage of fertilizers, pesticides, and other regulated products, and then also how you're managing your soils. So um, you can self-generate that, but in the application packet, we put together a questionnaire that satisfies the minimum legal standards for the information that we need. Um, and then also that plan is going to be used as the first step in our evaluation of whether or not you, you qualify for the certified Mendocino County Grown Sustainably Farmed designation. And so um, basically we've been given direction to um, mirror organic standards for that. So in order to do that, you have to prove that you're maintaining or improving soil quality over time. Um, you're taking action to enhance the on-farm biodiversity, and you're using only inputs, including fertility inputs, uh, approved by the National Organic Program. And something you should keep in mind is that the Department of Pesticide Regulation um, obviously put together a list of acceptable pesticides and is more restrictive than the list that's acceptable for certified organic food production. Um, so there's a checkbox of whether or not you're interested in having the sustainably farm designation. Um, and then just some examples of what we're looking for. Because um, we have we have checkbox answers, but we'd really like you to elaborate on things. So you can see here the question is do you practice soil conservation, yes or no? If yes, how? And I'm going to have a read through the next slide. We've got two examples of farms up here, and you can see the one on the left would check terraces, and then um, they would check other and write in that they use uh, these earth pots. And then the next question is, is, that, is do you experience problems with erosion? And you can, you can see that you know some of the bare soil is running away, and so they would say, yes, I am. <clears throat> And um, I, have a, I have a plan with the water board to vegetate some of this stuff, but I also have a road on my property that's eroding away pretty badly, and we're working on getting that properly graded and built first. And so this is not as high of a priority for us. Um, then you can see the, the property on the left. Um, you know, do you practice soil conservation? Yes, they use terraces. They um, intercrop and they plant winter cover crops. And then so you would basically, you know, please elaborate. You would say what, what you intercrop with and, and what sorts of winter cover crops you use when you plant them. Um, then do you, use, do you experience problems with soil erosion? Yeah, you know, he's, he'd say, yeah, I am a little bit. And right now I'm using straw and that seems to be working, but I'm keeping an eye on it. And if it's not, maybe I'll, I'll plant some sort of native rhizomatic plant to hold the soil in place there. Um, then another example, do you take actions to provide habitat for pollinators, insects, insect predators, birds, and bats? If yes, how? You know, maybe you have a bird, uh, a, a bat box on your barn, so you check that box and you just say where it is. And, you know, maybe, maybe you also um, plant mullein and lavender, so you check other and say that you plant that, that provides um, pollination for, habitat for pollinators. Um, so that's it for my presentation. I think right now we're going to go into a general Q&A where people could uh, ask questions and depending on um, which agency could best field that question, we could have a group discussion about them. Before we go to the Q&A, I call on the Randy Johnson from the Sheriff's Department. Good morning, thanks for coming out here today. We've been going at this almost two hours. You guys got all this already, huh? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Regulation. Yeah. Hey, listen, I just a couple things, uh, because I'm sure it's going through some of your minds. The 931 and 930 were in front of the board this week. 
and they've uh, adopted them, although they have to go to second reading still. But uh, just so you know, going forward, 9, uh, 931 does not allow 25 plants um, in the inland areas. So that will only allow 25 plants in the coastal zone areas. So if you're thinking you're doing 25, you have to be in this program. Otherwise, you'd be illegal. And for adult use, that's 100 square feet indoors or outdoors, and you have to have 10, 10 acres. So that's anywhere in the county for adult use. So those will have second reading, I think, on May 2nd. And as long as uh, they go uh, ratified, then they'll go into effect in 30 days after that. So if you're thinking 25, make sure you take your notes. And we'll ask. <laughs> You don't want my guys coming to your farm this year, okay? <laughs>